tonight, the delicate balancing act of reopening amid an unknown level of contagion. And that may kind of, you know, tip us over the line. As dangerous variants of COVID spread, scientists warn we may be reopening too quickly, even as families find out March break is being delayed. It reduces all of our experiences in their eyes to something that you could just check off on a box. Plus the piercing outrage following a tone-deaf Black History Month event in Durham. And how can I use this power and this position to open doors for other artists? And, and meet the poetry master taking a leadership role at a major Toronto theatre company. His plans to push for greater representation on the main stage. Good evening, I'm Chris Glover. A stark warning tonight from Ontario's COVID-19 modeling table. The province could be careening towards a third wave. That's if new variants of COVID-19 are not brought under control in a hurry. The projections come during the week. The province is loosening restrictions in some areas. Farah Morelli is joining us live tonight from Hospital Row. And Farah, doctors are saying that this is a precarious time. They are, Chris, and what they're saying is that the next few weeks could determine if, in fact, we go into a third wave early this spring. Now, this highly contagious variant first detected in the UK will soon become the dominant strain here. And tonight, a warning that if he public health measures are lifted, we could see cases go up very, very quickly. Two storylines, one pandemic. The number of COVID-19 cases is declining in Ontario, but this is what the numbers could look like in just a few weeks. The new variants of concern that spread so much more easily are here and they threaten to undo our progress. Today, the province's scientific advisory table said the variant first discovered in the UK will soon become the dominant strain here. It spreads faster, more easily. Without the ability to respond quickly and effectively, without the ability to control spread in the community, we face the very real risk of a third wave. The clear message, if public health measures are lifted, cases could go up fast. But that's already happening. Restrictions have been loosened in three public health units. Indoor dining has resumed and businesses have reopened. Stay-at-home orders will be rescinded in other places soon too. Today the province's top doctor defended the move. We're not opening up. We're allowing some things to be available, but we want even more personal adherence to the stay-at-home, to the masking, to limiting your household contact. But if we're going to be, you know, reopening that at the same time as relaxing other restrictions, then that may kind of, you know, tip us over the line. Those who've been studying COVID-19 variants warn opening schools and loosening more restrictions could be a recipe for a spike in cases. I don't know if we can kind of have everything at once of reopening schools as well as, you know, indoor dining and, um, and, and you know, fitness facilities where people are going to be, you know, spending significant amounts of time together indoors, unmasked, given the increased transmissibility of these variants. Things like that certainly make me very nervous. Another concern, the impact the variant spread might have on younger populations. The province's own data shows it's seeing more young people being admitted to the ICU. We've seen for B117 uh, that it may be uh, more deadly, causing more severe disease across all age groups, and that's certainly a concern uh, for many, but also for younger adults and children. As you heard there, Chris, a lot of concern about what the next few weeks hold when it comes to uh, fighting this virus. Now, one of the things, though, that Dr. Williams uh, emphasized a couple of times today was that uh, if the province, as it starts to loosen restrictions, starts to see cases go up slowly, it does have the tool which it's calling an emergency break, which is basically the ability to immediately bring in uh, stricter restrictions, maybe even a lockdown uh, to try and stem the spread. The question is, will that be enough uh, to prevent a third wave which uh, they're forecasting could be here in just a few weeks. Farah, thanks for this tonight. Now to help further deter travel and limit community transmission, the province also today announced that March break is being postponed to April. Ali Shias on now with the ruling and the reaction. Ontario is postponing March break until the week of April 12th. 
According to the province, it's an effort to discourage Ontario's 2 million students and their families from traveling or gathering during their time off, something we saw over the winter break. We recognize that congregation is a key driver of the spread of COVID-19, something we realized over the winter break, and we will not take that risk again with your child, with our staff. At least one third grader was disappointed to learn he would have to wait a little longer for a break. I don't really feel good about that. Because he's been locked up since December, you know, it would have been really nice to give him that. But if we have to wait another month for it to be safer, then I'm all for it. Opposition came from teachers unions and some school board representatives who've expressed that they wanted March break to stay put, especially after last month of teaching online, then being back to class this week. The burnout is real. January, um, I think I worked 10 times harder than I would in the classroom. Um, just making sure everything was up and running and making sure that everybody was online and understanding um, and troubleshooting. We need a break. While at the same time the province gradually reopens, the onus is still on the people to keep spread down by resisting the urge to congregate and travel during any kind of time off, like March break, or as we should say now, April break. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, remember yesterday when the province told us all long-term care residents had been vaccinated by the end of the day? Well, turns out that is not the case. Lorenda Redekop now with the bombshell backtrack. Win. This morning, the government said the first round of vaccinations in long-term care homes was completed. It had met the February 10th target. In Sarnia, the host of a local private radio program asked about that, putting the question to the local medical officer of health. Are we done vaccinating our residents in our long-term care homes in Sarnia Lambton? Almost. We're almost there. Okay. So by the end of this week, it should all be it should all be wrapped up. This morning, the NDP also raised questions about the government's claim. I'm hearing some disturbing suggestions that, in fact, there are still seniors uh, in long-term care uh, and other um, settings that, that might not have received their vaccine yet. And if that, in, in fact, is the case, it's extremely problematic. I checked with the Ministry of Long-Term Care. It then put out a statement citing a miscommunication, saying we sincerely regret the error. Well, there was a miscommunication internally, and that's what caused the, uh, the announcement to be made when there are still a few uh, long-term care homes that still need uh, their residents to be immunized. The ministry later said six of 626 homes are still waiting for that first dose for residents, expected to be finished in the coming days. The dates for these vaccinations has already yo-yoed. Start rolling out the vaccine into the long-term care homes and again the high-risk retirement homes around the rest of Ontario. And we've set ourselves a goal of 15 February. The government then moved that date up to February 5th. We're accelerating vaccinations from our most vulnerable seniors. But then? The shipment delays with the Pfizer vaccine have been incredibly disappointing. It changed it again. With an updated goal for completion of February 10th. February 10th was also the deadline for high-risk retirement home residents to get their first vaccine dose. That deadline wasn't met, and it's unclear when it'll happen. Today, the health minister only said that she hopes it'll be in very short order. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. To Etobicoke now, where a 35-year-old man was killed this evening after the truck he was driving rolled over on Highway 427. The OPP say they received a call just after 5 about a two-vehicle collision on the highway near Burnham Thorpe Road. The man was driving a commercial delivery truck northbound when it struck another vehicle also traveling north. He was the only person in the truck and was pronounced dead at the scene. There's no word on any other injuries. An update tonight on a heartbreaking story out of Kawartha Lakes. Ontario's police watchdog says they can now confirm an officer shot the one-year-old boy who died in Kawartha Lakes this fall. The incident happened early one morning in late November. Ontario Provincial Police tried to stop a pickup truck after receiving reports a father had abducted his son. The truck collided with a police cruiser and another vehicle, injuring an officer in the process. The 33-year-old driver had an interaction with the officers and three of them discharged their firearms. 
The man and his one-year-old son inside the truck were shot. Both died of their injuries. A pistol was also located in the man's vehicle. Now to Durham, where officials at the regional headquarters were forced to apologize today for a tone-deaf Black History Month event that was put together for staff. Employees were asked to complete a series of tasks that several staff members found offensive. Greg Ross breaks down the backlash. This is the memo that was sent out to staff in Durham Region, asking them to rise to the challenge. It listed a series of tasks for employees to complete, things like cooking an African or Caribbean meal, dance to a reggae song, and have a conversation with a black employee. It's still something that I need to take responsibility for, and, and we need to do things better. Today, the chair and CEO of Durham Region, John Henry, accepted responsibility. I'm sorry, it's embarrassing, and to the community, I apologize. Um, that we can do better. Although Henry says he only learned about this challenge yesterday and that it was put together by a committee he wasn't a part of, former insane. Whitby MP Otherwise Selena Caesar Chavan says if he's like taking this, responsibility, he needs to do more than just apologize. So, I think the only thing left to do is if you cannot do your job, that it's probably a good time to leave it. Chief and Administrative Officer for the Region of Durham, Durham Elaine baxter Teher says they were attempting to create an inclusive workplace. The intent was to educate our staff. It was an internal exercise on Black History as part of Black History Month. But Caesar Chavan says they did the opposite. It, it reduces all of our experiences in their eyes to something that you could just check off on a box. And that's not who we are. That's not what our history is. And that's not what our culture is. The names of the people who organized this have not been released, but many were asking today if there were any Black people on the committee. Yes, there were. Uh, and it was also discussed with uh, other uh, black individuals that were not on the committee. Diversity coach Jeff Martin says the memo was tone deaf, completely missing the point of Black History Month. It's about learning about the people, learning about who they are, learning about their plight, their story, and how they got to where they are today. Moving forward, Henry says the Durham Regional Council is in the process of creating a department to specifically deal with anti-black systemic racism. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. The city of Toronto's budget is in the spotlight today with the mayor pushing for millions of dollars to support COVID-19 hotspots. I would advance the view that it is likely the most difficult and challenging budget year in the history of the city because of uh, the pandemic and because of the effects of COVID-19. Mayor John Tory says he wants the budget to keep taxes low. He's proposing $8 million in new spending in the city's COVID-19 hotspots. The money would help support youth jobs, mental health, internet access for low-income communities and local businesses. The city is dealing with a record $649 million budget gap. Tory plans to make up for some of that shortfall with a special dividend from the Toronto Parking Authority. Council will vote on the final budget next week. Time for a short break, and when we return, my interview with a new leader at Soul Pepper Theater. How the award winning poet is hoping to reinvigorate the theater com uh, company amid a pandemic. Plus, Colette's got a look at the bone chilling forecast. Colette. The extreme cold weather alert has returned for the city. I'm meteorologist Colette Kennedy. We also have a winter weather travel advisory in one area. I'll tell you all about that coming up after the break.
The weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. We test, so it runs. It's hard to stop a train. The Raptors will not be returning to Toronto this season. The team announced today it'll play the rest of its home games in Tampa this year. The team cited ongoing challenges related to the pandemic and crossing the border for its decision. Anyone entering the country has to, of course, isolate for 14 days, which wouldn't allow NBA teams enough time to maintain their schedule. Toronto's under an extreme cold weather alert tonight with warming centers opening up for at-risk residents needing to escape the deep chill. And over the next 24 hours, the temperature is only expected to get even colder. Colette Kennedy joining us now. Colette, at least we had a good dose of sunshine today. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so nice to have some sunshine today, especially when we have such cold air in place and it's really sinking in here. And that's why through the overnight hours, we are going to see some of those wind chills getting colder than even minus 20, approaching minus 25. So the extreme cold weather alert back in place for the city, getting those warming centers opened up. I do have some light snow in our forecast for Saturday. I know there's lots of areas where there's still snow there, but we'll add to it, get some fresh snow in there uh, for sledding and other activities. And yes, for our ski hills as well. And uh, more snow on Tuesday. And you know what, if I went beyond that, it looks like more snow coming on Thursday. So every few days, we're gonna be getting into that pattern as that storm track is starting to push back up here uh, towards the Great Lakes, or at least just to the south of us and bring those systems through. Our highs today, it's hard to say, but hey, they're only about three degrees, three, four degrees off uh, seasonal norms. Minus five Toronto and minus five for Oshawa. Kingston at minus six. Same thing there for Windsor. Well, a winter weather travel advisory because of the winds coming off the lake. And this is for overnight tonight, but really kind of more towards tomorrow morning and the early part of the day on Friday. So through northern Niagara region there, St. Catharines, Grimsby, over towards Hamilton, you're included in this as well. Just be aware, probably at the amounts might be only around five centimeters here or even a little less, but the visibility reduced and it makes for some slick roadways. And you can see that right here. Here it is 8 a.m. and what's going on through the Niagara region. We could pick up a few flurries, maybe towards western sections of the GTA, but uh, not with this one or these lake effect getting into uh, any kinds of accumulations. Now, looking ahead towards Saturday, that's kind of a different story. It'll start as light flurry activity towards southwestern Ontario, and then really starting to see those flurries beginning into the afternoon, turning into a more widespread light snow Saturday and overnight Saturday, clearing out of the GTA, but leaving behind, yeah, we're going to see maybe as little as three centimeters, but going up in some areas close to six or seven, you'll have it enhanced in the Niagara region, and that's because of the lake effect and then adding the system going through uh, perhaps another five centimeters, four or five back towards the Windsor area, where overnight tonight, your temperature will be minus 10, feeling like minus 17 tomorrow, mostly cloudy conditions and the high minus five for you there. So definitely running on the cool side. Overnight tonight, look at these numbers. It's a little better in St. Catharines because of the lake effect, but mark a minus 16. Yeah, really significant with those wind chills. So you do have to get dressed appropriately. Make sure the kids are, are dressed, even your pets as well. And uh, there you go tomorrow afternoon. Mm, not doing too well. Still a few degrees cooler than even today with those daytime highs. There's that system coming through Saturday, clearing out Sunday. Temperatures going up a little bit. And then the next one, comes through on Tuesday. That one looks like it could be more significant, five to 10 centimeters, but it's a little far off still, Chris. Yeah, let's delay that conversation for a bit. Thanks, Scalette. Toronto's largest not-for-profit theater company, Soul Pepper, is amping up its leadership roster. The theater has just appointed poet Luke Reese as the new associate artistic director. The spoken word artist has multiple national titles under his belt and is also an acclaimed playwright, producer, and educator. This week, I got a chance to talk to him about how he hopes to push the theater company to new heights. I feel overwhelmed with uh, love and excitement. It's, it's, I'm pumped. Your resume, it, there's so many different titles on there. You got poet. My father never learned how to seek for help. Producer, he didn't know uh, how to tell my you know, writer, educator, storyteller. 
I I'm curious, which of those titles and roles do you connect with the most and maybe which one do you feel the most passionate about and excited to kind of bring that experience here to this role? I think it's, it's actually the, the educator and the curator side of me where I'm really in this artistic, uh, associate artistic director role, able to curate a season, to think about what is it, what it is that we want to uh, offer our audiences and our artists. It's so important to uh, represent different stories to children as well as they're coming up, as they're learning about the world and about art. So to be able to be out here front facing so people know that they can have this job one day, like that's all a part of education. I didn't know I could be in a leadership job at an arts organization until I saw Philip Aiken, who came to my school and talked to me about what that meant. One of the things that I saw the artistic director talk about uh, in, in one of the things that she loved about you was that you were dedicated to being a champion for new voices and emerging artists. And I'm, and I'm curious, in this moment that, that we're in, fighting anti-black racism and in the middle of Black History Month, how are you going to make sure that black people's stories are told on stages in you know, a more authentic, a more real way? For me, it's really about using my opportunity to create more opportunities. Whenever I step into a position like this, it's not about taking up the space just for myself, but it's looking at how can I use this power and this position to open doors for other artists and welcome them in with me as well. Um, before this, I was working with Obsidian Theatre Company, the largest black theatre company in Canada. So I've got a history of, of really supporting black voices, and a lot of those artists I want to take with me here. You know, it's a, it's a bigger stage, it's a larger company. Um, it's, a, it's one of the only organizations that's not a culturally specific company with black leadership, and, and that's huge, and that's important, and that's a statement and for the city and for the, the country as well. We know right now that poetry and spoken word is really having a moment right across the world because of primarily Amanda Gorman in the States with her amazing performance at the inauguration for Joe Biden. If only we're brave enough to be it. I'm curious, as, as a poet yourself and somebody who does slam poetry, how are you feeling given this moment that we're in? Oh, it's so exciting. You know, the spoken word poets, we've been here, we've been around. Uh, if you look back to the 2010 Vancouver Olympics, actually Shane Poison opened up the ceremony in Vancouver, a Canadian poet. So I'm excited for us to take these stages. And I think the beautiful thing about spoken word is we're able to tell a really specific, clear story in a matter of minutes. Perfect. Well, congratulations again on the role. I know a lot of people are rooting for you and excited to see what you're going to do with it. Thank you so much. A fun conversation there, and you can find more stories like this one on our website. That's at cbc.ca slash being black in Canada, or check us out on Instagram. Stay with us. We're, bra we're back after a quick break.
Here's a Valentine's tradition for you. The World Sick Organization of Canada throws a donation drive to help women's shelters in the GTA. And this year, it went ahead despite the pandemic. SEVA, uh, that means uh, selfless service, is a big tenant in our uh, community. So uh, wherever we see that our community can participate and you know, give, be giving, uh, either in terms of give happiness and joy or give these essential items or whether we donate to food banks, uh, our community always steps up. The packages will help hundreds of women and children at four GTA shelters, and the gift boxes include sanitary pads, shampoo, face wash, and soap. And for the kids, pencils, gum, and toothbrushes, and they will also get a Valentine's Day card. I love that, spreading the love and the joy around this Valentine's Day. And that is our show for you tonight. We'll leave you with more beautiful pictures of the northern lights in chilly Saskatchewan. If you thought we were having a cold snap, it is colder out there with that polar vortex. But look at these amazing shots. They were taken by an off-duty paramedic in La Range. Have a great night.